Good morning, everybody, and thank you for signing on. Good evening and good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Nick Dewhurst, and I'd like to thank you for coming to the first DFMA virtual event. At Boothroyd Dewhurst, we make software tools to help companies understand and manage cost. Our design for assembly software in industry since 1983 has helped companies save billions of dollars over the decades that it's been in use. Using the software helps companies identify opportunities for simpli simplification of their products, resulting in significant cost savings at the product level. Our design for manufacture tools in industry for over 30 years provide a suite of time-tested cost models to help companies understand the should cost of component manufacture at all stages of a product's development. This information is widely used to help companies reduce cost in the supply chain, as well as identify early where cost problems within new products potentially lie. Today, you're gonna to hear four presentations from Boothroyd Dewhurst customers. These presentations are about the use of our software on their products, their strategies for implementation, and helpful hints and tips for others getting started on their DFMA journey. The go-to webinar control panel has a questions function. And I'd like to encourage the audience to use the questions function to ask questions during the presentations. We'll be monitoring that and getting back to you. And I'll also select one or two questions at the end of each presentation that will let the speaker answer live. If we don't get to your question, the speaker or someone from Boothroy Dewhurst will get back to you after the event. If you have other questions or things that we can help you with after the event, please email us at info at dfma.com or you can visit our website, www.dfma.com. Our first presentation uh, is from Endresen Hauser and we're gonna have Dr. Volker Fry and Dr. Raphael Kernan giving a speech. Um, I'm going to switch to um, them right now. And while that's in process, uh, I can tell you that uh, Dr. Fry uh, has a university diploma in mechanical engineering at KIT. He was department head at Motorola in the and was instrumental in the development and rollout of an in-house MES system. He's the production manager of solid, was the production manager of solid forms at Novartis Pharmaceuticals. And currently he's a strategy expert at Endress and Hauser on cost reduction and digitalization. Dr. Kernan has a university diploma in physics from the University of Freiburg, a PhD from the University of Freiburg, where he uh, worked <clears throat> on electron wave packet interference and directed emissions of electrons in a two-color laser field. And he's currently a technology expert uh, in sensor systems and technology at Endress and Hauser. Guys, take it away. Yeah, thank you. So uh, new times require new approaches. Here is one to keep business running during a lockdown and pandemic times. Welcome everybody out there to listen to our presentation about our e &H approach in this pandemic times. My name is Volker and I will share the next 20 minutes presentation together with Raphael. He will, we will cover a short introduction to Anderson Hauser, uh, our history of DFMA at Anderson Hauser, uh, our handling of COVID-19 pandemic. And then I will switch over to Raphael, who is then going into detail how we manage the DFMA or DFA workshops during uh, this lockdown times. Um, and at the end, we will have a short summary in a nutshell. So uh, e &H is a company for process automation. Every day, life involves uh, manufactured goods from process applications like beer, food, pharmaceuticals. And um, we help our customers of the process automation. Raphael, will you just uh, push the button? We help our customers uh, of process automation to efficiently and safe run their uh, companies. And therefore, we provide sensors 
for level measurement, pressure level, uh, pressure measurement, flow, analytical temperature uh, measurements, software solutions like IIoT solutions and system products. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, to give you an overview of our company, we are a family-owned company founded 1953 with 14,000 uh, people worldwide. We have 2.65 billion net sales a year uh, and um, we invest 230 million euros each year. Uh, our return on sales is 13% and we are very uh, active in patents. Okay, next one. Um, the history of DFMA at Andresen Hauser started in 1916 when I went from operational management to strategic uh, tasks. And here I got in touch with um, BDA or the uh, European um, a, a company AMC who represents BDA in Europe. Uh, we ran with Mr. Hausmann in October 9, uh, 2016. A, a, a pilot run and then after that we decided to go for DFMA as our cost reduction tool. Uh, we trained four DFA moderators where Raphael is one of them and five DFM experts in uh, 2017 and we were in a starting phase very very successful. We saved 1 million euros in the year uh, 2017 to 2018 with the help of the FMA. And uh, yeah, we also won the Process Innovation Award of our company for that um, effort. Then in uh, 2019, we managed to, um, to anchor DFA and DFM as a mandatory process step in our innovation process. That means every innovation project has to run a DFA and, a D and DFM studies to reduce their costs. Um, and we integrated also, and this was a real luck, we integrated DFMA into our digital workspace process suite in June 2019. Um, during that time, we also convinced our sister companies, Andresen Hauser TS, they produced um, 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 temperature sensors and also Andresen Hauser Flow uh, to adopt the DFMA pro, uh, uh, tools from BDA. And they are also re, uh, successfully running uh, DFM and DFA studies. Today, for our subsidiary, we have around a 176 people in the DFA club. That means they are at least, they have at least one uh, DFA study um, taken and we have uh, 41 DFA and hundreds of DFM already run. This was very successful and we looked in the year 19, uh, 2020. Um, then the COVID-19 case uh, happened and uh, in January 27th, the first case in Germany appeared. In March, when at the elves, at the eleventh, German government declared pandemic times, and March 16th we had a partial lockdown of our company, which means within two days we sent 1,200 indirect labor associates uh, to home office, and had to try to keep business running with these people out in their home offices. And until today, two thirds of our indirect labor is still in their home offices. However, they are uh, periodically coming in and going out so that we don't lose contact to the people so that they know in Christmas that they are still working with e &H. Uh, and now you are probably aware that uh, we will we face a new partial lockdown. However, we e &H, are pretty well prepared for this phase. Um, and uh, we will also run our DFA workshops successfully in these times. Now it's time for 
uh, Raphael to show you the details, which tools we use and how we run the DFA studies uh, during this pandemic times. Uh, thank you, Volker, for this nice uh, recap of our journey with DFMA and uh, thank you, the rest of you, for having been he uh, me here. So the challenge we are facing is, um, well, we all knew how it was before COVID-19. Uh, we were working in a face-to-face -face environment. We could see each other, had nice discussions. Uh, we could scribble together to find new ideas and just put post-its on, on the wall and talk about them. And well, this now has to be transferred in a face-to-screen environment where you sit on your desk and have uh, a monitor in front of you as you probably all have right now. This of course has some uh, quite unique boundary conditions because you can only see a certain amount of what you see in the meeting room in the DFMA sessions uh, we all know uh, and we all did before. And uh, in this environment, we still have to do all that, all what we could do in the face-to-face -face world. And this is quite a challenge. And uh, our luck was that we before already uh, implemented a digital workplace system in the company. Um, in our case, it's uh, the environment from Microsoft, but it will work as well with G Suite or whatever there's out. And uh, this is how we did it. First of all, in a perfect world, we would all have broadband internet access, but well, sadly, our 2,000 employees in, uh, in our location are spread around uh, the countryside and we have everything from good internet connection to, uh, it's called it the pigeon birds are carrying the bites, which makes it quite hard uh, to have such sessions in a qualified manner. So. We chose to use uh, Skype for Business as uh, the skeleton of uh, what we are doing, uh, with which we are sh sharing audio, the screen sharing, and the chat functionality uh, as primary communication basis. Now, when the bandwidth shrinks down and the first people are, are shooting out of, uh, of the internet, the first thing to sacrifice is uh, the shared screen because this is taking up the most bandwidth resource in such sessions. That's why the, the spine of the skeleton is a one-note uh, notebook, which I will talk about later on. And this is uh, shared via the digital workplace, so everybody has access to that. And this needs quite little bandwidth. So even if you can't see it in the shared screen, you can still see it if you open it on your computer and uh, can follow what happens because only text is transmitted right there. In parallel to this, we have a PowerPoint presentation which summarizes all the assembly steps. This is quite important, which we'll see in a minute. And if somebody really drops out of the internet from time to time, okay, it, then he's not synchronized anymore. But as soon as he gets connection again, uh, he will immediately see on, on which page we are on the assembly or disassembly step. And the one node will be synchronized immediately and uh, the participant can immediately see what happened in that time and will be up to date in a very short time. Anyway, if you're offline all the time, it will be hard anyways. But mostly we are in the first two uh, columns here. So that most of the time the people are online, sometimes a little bit limited which to the videos and shared screen and that stuff, but the rest will work quite fine. So how does this OneNote notebook look like? Well, we have a couple of, uh, of tabs here and in each tab, a couple of pages. Let's start with the first one. There are just general informations. For example, the main goal or the focus of the DFMA may be uh, concept evaluations or really pushing down the costs uh, as hard as possible because this requires a little, uh, a little different moderation scheme depending on what you do. And of course, very important, um, an, uh, an up-to-date timetable which is uh, always adapted during the session, because if you drop out of, uh, of the session and log in uh, again later and see, whoa, nobody's here anymore. Uh, you can just have a look and see, oh, okay, they decided to have a coffee break for 10 minutes, all right, we'll meet then. 
you can just see this is important. The second uh, tab, which is opened right here in the picture, um, summarizes all necessary information for the product to be investigated. For example, the planned steps and the projects and the timetables for the milestones, kickoff presentations, other available documents, and everything you need to get a picture on, on what is going on in this uh, project. And the most important for the following step is uh, a certain presentation which describes all the disassembly and assembly steps. We ask our design engineers to prepare this document prior to the, ses uh, to the session because this makes it way more easy to uh, go through this process without seeing each other. Then there are a couple of, uh, of tabs related to the ideas. Uh, um, the first is unsorted ideas, which is important in the next step. And the colorful ones are then uh, the categories which will be filled later on in the discussion of the ideas. And the last tab is for DFM sessions. Uh, especially in the online form, we are not doing DFM sessions together with DFA. We try to do all necessary DFM sessions prior to the DFA session. And of course, if we, uh, if we identify some parts during the DFA session to be covered by a DFM, we will do it later on, because um, usually the majority of the audience will be a little bit bored by doing the DFM uh, studies within the DFA session, because you only need a certain subset of people to do this properly. So we decouple this completely to, to keep this very thin what we are doing, very slick. Now, how does a disassembly look like? Well, usually me as a moderator, I will share uh, my screen and uh, this is a, a screenshot of that. On the one side, you have the DFA tool. On, on the other side, you have uh, this disassembly slides prepared by the design engineer. And usually I ask the design engineer to, uh, prior to the real session, to go through each slide and explain what's, what his plan is so that everybody knows what is meant with each page. So this reduces the questions necessary uh, during the disassembly sessions. And after this is done, we go to the stop top and start uh, disassemble, uh, start the disassembly process as we are used to, step by step, and build the product tree. After that, doing the assembly, just backwards on the slides, and all the ideas which are usually put on, on, on post-its on the wall are to be filled in into this uh, OneNote uh, notebook I described earlier. So this will be the, the, the assembly. And the ideas are covered in this way. You see here on the right uh, in gray, this, this column, those are the ideas. And request, we request the participants to, to keep a certain uh, form. So of course, the title, as each, each idea will have a, a, an own page so that we can move it to other categories if necessary. And of course, the name should be uh, clear for everybody so that one knows what it's about. And we want uh, that the name is in front of it, of uh, the participant who wrote the idea. So we can ask if something is unclear and somebody dropped out and came in later on. And uh, then it is filled up during the whole process. All the ideas are put in the unsorted part and will be, yeah, and if the disassembly and assembly process are, are finished, usually there's a copy break. And uh, I ask the project manager or the design engineer, depending on the focus of the DFA, to do a little clustering in the copy break so that we, when we come back in the, uh, to, to discuss all those ideas, uh, it's already clustered and um, we are a little bit more straightforward in, in discussing those. And the advantage of having this PowerPoint presentation with the disassembly and assembly steps uh, prepared is a nice little thing because you can just copy and paste your pictures out of them and put it into this idea page and do your, your scribbling on that to make clear what you are, what you are saying and, and just 
you don't have to paint everything yourself you have a nice starting point to show what what the differences are you are you are pr uh, proposing so when the idea presentations are due then we go through each idea as we are used to do it with the post-its and uh, the participant who wrote the idea is, uh, is telling what he wants to do um, adds pictures is necessary we discussed this and another name is added in front of this idea page and this is the name of the responsible person namely the one i will ask in a checkup uh, what what is going on with this idea is it done or what is what happened and our participants usually use this one note as a working document as well because this is available uh, available all the time in their digital workplace so they do not have to to do their own stuff uh, if they got answers to the questions they can immediately add it to this page um, we left this open to them to do or not to do but it is as it turn, uh, turns out they like it they really want to do it right there because everything is in one place and they don't have to search and afterwards to put everything together they just work on this document and if we then jump into the checkups a couple of weeks later then those ideas are filled up with more information and uh, solutions and new ideas and what happens and um, the shared screen then looks like this we have the dfa tool on the on the one side uh, in order to adapt the product tree and on the other side this working document this one uh, notebook and we go through every idea and discuss what happened with this and, and what to do and what's left and uh, well actually the same process we know from a standard dfa just in an online form the ideas are then resorted in the tabs above for a b a c grade and so on and well of course in all this process there are quite a lot of pros and some cons the pros are for me as a moderator um, there's less work for me because if i do it in an online form like we are doing right now there's only one person who can talk at one time otherwise you have a complete mess this is nice because you have a clear order in there you have a central working document this is very nice everybody knows where to find all information there's no sending around stuff it's just everything there and the preparation of this assembly uh, slides helps the design engineer because usually if it's especially if it's the first dfa process for a design engineer it can be quite hard and intimidating because everybody is uh, searching for flaws in his or her design and if you already went through this uh, one time you already knows pretty much how to answer most of the question because he has in, uh, in front of his imaginary eye and, and, and can can better react on what's coming the cons are very clear uh, they are <laughs> the the pro for me as a moderator is the contra for for the whole process there are no subsidiary discussions well no is a little bit too much to say it's you can do side chats but this is not for everybody but these discussions as a moderator i have to uh, to hold it at a certain level not nothing but not too much because those discussions uh, very often lead to very high quality ideas and those might get lost then of course you have no eye to eye contact um, you could do a video chat but if you have all those very small pictures on on your screen it wouldn't help very much um, if you've experienced dfa participants it's not that hard but if you have newbies in there um, you usually need the eye to, eye to eye contact to see when they are lost and to pull them back into the discussions that you can't do if you just have an audio uh, connection but if you have experienced dfa uh, participants you can manage to have about the same quantity and the same quality of ideas out of a session like that and it is usually a little bit faster to do as on the offline form but you need the right people then with newbies this is not that easy possible now what have we done in a nutshell so we introduced the one node as our central working environment 
it is shared, it is synchronized in real time, it is, it is as well offline as online editable, and everything is centralized in this. Uh, the second thing, uh, second, second thing is you have the assembly or disassembly slides prepared. This is very nice for easy referencing. If you have bandwidth itch issues, somebody goes out of the internet and asks, oh, where are we? And you just say slide 11 and everybody knows where we are. And it's a nice source for copy and paste of pictures and it helps describing your ideas. And the moderator leads through the process with a shared split screen for the disassembly and assembly with the DFA tool and those slides for the idea presentation with the swan note and the slides. And last but not least for the checkups with the DFA tool and the one note to gather all information together. And this is how we manage to do DFMA sessions during those crazy times. And now I'm happy to answer all the questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, Raphael, thank you very much. Um, we did have a couple of questions come in uh, through the through the uh, questions feature, which again I'm going to encourage people in the in the audience to go to that go to webinar control panel. And uh, in the uh, the various sections of that, there's one called questions, and you can submit questions directly that way. Um, one of the questions is, uh, how did you go about incorporating drawings, the usual method for engineers to communicate? Yeah, this is, that's again, a kind of a, a copy and paste thing. Um, in this uh, OneNote document, you can, put in screenshots of whatever whatever you like and just shoot them in and do it at all uh, again those slides for the disassembly this is what's meant um, which form you choose depends on what's the style of your design engineers um, since we are uh, very much focusing on what's happening with uh, with the production uh, employees uh, we tend to do those 3D images because this is easier for them to uh, to understand what's really meant uh, in contrast to just putting uh, the drawings out there. They don't know what this meant. After all, they will have a part in the hand and this is what they are interested in. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have time for one more here. This is a, a pretty good one. Do you do some kind of introductory uh, DFMA training to new participants prior to attending one of these sessions or is the session itself their first exposure to the dfma tools and methodology uh usually i ask prior to uh to the dfa session uh who of the participants already uh has experience in dfa and depending on that answer i decide uh, if i do an introduction or if i don't if two-thirds are well aware of what's going on in an offline session, this is not a problem because they will just tell them, hey, keep quiet, we are coming to that point. But in, a, in an offline version, this is not possible. So there I tend to do an introduction if someone is there without experience. If everybody has already done one, I skip this part and jump right in. But yes, if there are newbies inside, I will do a little introduction and tell what this is all about. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there are a bunch of other questions, but in the interest of uh, keeping this moving along, we'll, we'll get back to you that had those questions offline. So, um, uh, Raphael and uh, Volker, thank you very much for your presentation. And we will now switch to uh, Hector from Frigio Glass. Thank you, it was so a pleasure. Hector. Okay, Hector should be making the presentation. And uh, so our, our, our next speaker is Hector Pergamalis. Hector is an engineer by trade and started his profession professional career in the plastics industry, working for one of Europe's largest plastic manufacturers. Um, since 2017, he's responsible for the manufacturing operations and product development at Frigio Glass, a leading B2B provider of ice cold merchandising solutions to the beverage industry in Europe, Asia, and Africa. 
Hector is a Lean Six Sigma black belt and passionate not only about waste-free products, but also about database decision-making and people empowerment. He holds a master's degree in mechanical engineering and a PhD in fluid mechanics from Imperial College London, as well as an MBA from the University of Athens School of Economics and Business. Hector, thank you very much. Please proceed. Nick, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, a very warm good morning or good afternoon to all the participants and a very big thank you for uh, the opportunity to present the first steps in the DFMA introduction in Frigo Glass. I have about uh, 20 net slides. I'm going to be taking the next 20 to 25 minutes presenting the journey. Uh, but before I go into the presentation, just a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, the pun is intended in the title. DFMA is indeed a hot topic for us, but our products are not cooler than yours. They are actually the coolers themselves. So I will take a little bit of time in the beginning to introduce the company, introduce the product, a little bit of history of how DFMA came into existence into Frigo Glass, and then launch into some technical examples to show you the results of what we did. So uh, just at a glance, um, as Nick said, Frigo Glass is actually a key strategic partner to the beverage industry worldwide. You can see a, 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 a small list of our bigger customers below. And basically what we do is actually two things. We make commercial refrigerators, we call them coolers, and we also make all of the rest of the materials the beverage industry needs to basically sell their product, like glass bottles, plastic plates, crowns for the bottles, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm the manufacturing director of the ICM division of Frigo Glass, and uh, I'm currently connecting over from Europe in Athens, Greece, where the company is headquartered. Um, our footprint basically is um, spans three continents. We are active in uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and we have 11 production plants and several sales offices and service centers. Now, why service centers? Because being a key strategic partner to the beverage industry means that we offer vertical integration services. So we also take care of placement and after sales service of our own products that we have sold to this industry. Um, we have five um, plants building our coolers. And uh, these are in Romania, in Russia, uh, in India, Indonesia, and in South Africa. And in Nigeria, we are very active in the glass, basically, business there over in Africa. Um, basically, as you see, we're operating in some of the world's most populous countries. Actually, eight out of our 11 plants are in the top 10 uh, most populous countries in the world. This is obviously a key driver to um, for developing beverage placement needs, and we need to be close to our customers. Uh, let's not forget that we're shipping empty boxes around the world. Um, now, Frigo Glass is a half a billion turnover company. So let's say a medium enterprise. Our sales are in 100 countries, and most of our sales um, take place in Europe. And actually, we're uh, a, a very big partner with the Coca-Cola system. Now, uh, let's take a closer look to the ICM division, uh, which is the point of uh, today's, uh, today's talk. Um, basically, we're into mass customization. So we have customers that want a customized product in order to satisfy their marketing needs and help them sell the product. In the last uh, 20 years, we have sold about 10 million 
of those units. And um, we, in the last, uh, let's say, three to four years, uh, the division has been accomplishing uh, something which is quite difficult. We are expanding the business, um, growing our sales, but also making, uh, controlling our costs in the way. And this has a very positive development also in our BDA. Having said that, we are working, we're struggling to go from single digit uh, ABDA margins to double digit, and we were able to do that last year, and the FMA has been and will be a part of this journey. Now, on the right uh, bottom, you will see that basically uh, the majority of our sales, mirroring the group sales, are in Europe, where we have very strong presence. Uh, we're a market leader uh, in Europe in terms of um, coolers or ICMs, ice cold merchandisers. And uh, actually, you have more than 70% chance to pick a cold Coke out of our products than any of those from our competitors. Um, that said, Asia, which is one of the most populous continents on the planet, there we're facing a little bit of challenges with our sales. You see that it's a, a measly 10%. Uh, part of the story is the higher cost consciences, obviously, and also competition from Far East manufacturers. So in today's short presentation, I will be focusing on a small part of what we're doing actually in Asia uh, in terms of product redesign to increase our competitiveness and uh, basically improve our margins there. Now, before going into the technical detail, let me just mention that we have two product development hubs. One is in Greece, where the company is headquartered, and the other one is in India. You see the little green dots on the map. The red dots are our production plants. Now, for the Asia business, India is our mainstay. It is the second most populous world in the, uh, country in the world. So um, let's take a look, actually, what we're making there. So this is the product range um, that uh, we manufacture in India. And actually, you see that there is approximately 30, 33 different models in eight uh, different families. Um, they all look quite similar, right? I mean, there, there's just a box with some shelves and a glass door in the front. However, we have several thousands of variants, SKUs. Why? Because we're into mass customization. So, in a sense, we're trying to do what the Onto industry does, but in a completely different budget. We offer different combinations of colors, artwork, shelving, uh, illumination, aesthetic, performance, and also controlling connectivity options to both local and export customers. So handling this complexity in a single plant with uh, two main assembly lines is quite a challenge, both from a supply chain perspective, but also from a manufacturing perspective in terms of uh, you know, different assembly sequences, different materials that we need to um, that we need to feed our lines. Uh, one more operational difficulty here is our strong seasonality. Uh, naturally, everyone, everybody wants a cold product when it is summer. So our customers uh, basically queue up the door to get their products before the hot season. But in winter, we're uh, very, very quiet. So to achieve some sort of efficiency, we naturally want to level our production. But the mass customization means that this is very challenging. I mean, we have to guess the inventory. So uh, generally speaking, all of these things combine to cost to pose cost challenges in our production. And if you combine this with the highly cost conscious needs of uh, the Indian market, you can understand that uh, small cost or price variations can quickly lead the business to the red. So uh, can the FMA help here? Uh, you bet. And we will see how in a short while. 
And I think it is quite important before going into the technical detail to uh, share a little bit to break down the product for you uh, in order to set a little bit the, the vocabulary so that uh, all the audience uh, can follow what I'm trying to, um, to describe. So um, nine major functional group is what comprise our coolers. So we start with um, number one, which is the insulated cabin. And basically, this is the biggest component. Starts life as uh, uh, thin steel sheets, which we cut to size, we CNC punch them, and then we bend them into parts. Those parts are then are pre-assembled by hand into a shell, which uh, consists of the outer cabin and the inner cabin, the red and the white that uh, you see on the rendering. This shell is a little bit flimsy, so what we do then is inject it with polyurethane foam and put it in a mold to let the foam expand, cure, and bond the whole uh, place, uh, the, the whole piece together. And after that, we have the insulated cabin, which basically is the chassis of uh, the rest of the um, the rest of the product. Then we have the cooling mechanism. You see it there at uh, number two. Uh, basically, this is a base where all the individual components are mounted, a compressor, a condenser, a drip tray, fans, you name it. Uh, this is connected to an evaporator. This is the thing hanging out the top. And this basically provides the cooling airstream and circulation of cold air inside the cabin. And uh, this is done by forced convection. We use some fans and uh, there is a casing that basically encompasses the evaporator and the fans and makes the whole thing work. And you see that on the top of the rendering uh, also with number two. Now to close the box, we have the glass door. The, this is the, the whole point of the product. Uh, you need, the, our customers need to, to show and sell the products. So we need the glass door. And this is obviously one of the main differences between household refrigerator that we have at home and a commercial merchandising cooler. Um, the other big difference actually has to do with performance. Um, just to illustrate this, uh, just imagine the loading operation with cans or bottles of a cooler like this on a shop or a kiosk. So there's a truck arriving, uh, the product comes out uh, on a pallet, and then the shop owner needs to load the cooler. Now, usually the consumption happens, most of the consumption happens in summer. So the product has ambient temperature. It could reach 40 degrees Celsius or more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have ever drunk a warm Coke or beer, then you can relate very well to the fact that our product needs to cool down the cans inside it very, very quickly. Um, no paying customer actually will hold on to a warm can. The sale will be lost. So the cooling performance has to be very high to absorb and dump this heat very, very quickly uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner of uh, speech. ICMs are like uh, muscle cars or hot hatches over here in Europe. We put the biggest possible engine on the smallest possible chassis, okay? Domestic refrigerators, what we have at home, are completely the opposite. They have a very small engine in a very big frame. Um, this is only possible, by the way, at home because the majority of the products that we put inside the refrigerator usually are already cold from the supermarket. So, um, Moving away now from the cooling mechanism and having dumped, let's say, the heat rapidly, the cooler needs to go into a conservation mode so that we and we try to use as little energy as possible. And this is done basically by the control system, which is number five on the bottom left of the rendering. And we call this an electrical box. And the reason why this is a box is that it needs to be modular to facilitate servicing on the <clears throat> In, in the market. And um, I'd like to point out here that uh, for commercial coolers, 
placement is not only indoors, it is also outdoors. So the servicing needs are quite, uh, quite demanding and very, very important in terms of uh, selling features of the product. And by the way, it is for the same servicing reason that you see some frame rails right at the bottom of the cabin. The cooling mechanism needs to slide in and out to allow easy access and servicing of components. Uh, to cap everything off, we have the front grid number four, which is like the hood of the car. It basically hides the mechanism and actually our, um, our customers also like to brand this. We use this as a branding surface. Finally, we have the shelving, uh, which has a lot of options uh, according to the size of the cans or bottles that we're putting in, price tag uh, mounting possibilities. And uh, finally, the whole thing is held together by the fasteners group at number six and packaged depending on the destination and the severity of the trip with our packaging uh, solutions at number nine. So, all of this is good, but how do these functional group relate to cost? So you see this in the graph, more than 50% of the cost in terms of either material cost or labor cost hide inside the cabin and the cooling mechanism. So these functional groups actually pose the biggest chance of getting cost out. So how did we go about it? Actually, we try to make this opportunity visible to our people and show them easy ways to do it. And this is exactly where DFMA entered the game. So uh, I would like to go through a little bit of history um, before, uh, just to set the stage. So uh, it was in the middle of 2017 uh, when I took up the responsibility of ICM manufacturing in Freo glass and uh, very quickly recognized that the manufacturing complexity uh, of the company's products was actually quite high, something that I was not used to. Um, the problem was that this was not really visible, understood or accepted even by the rest of the organization. Um, so uh, I was handed out a mandate to drastically reduce the costs, as is always the case. And the expectation actually was to go and attack the manufacturing operations first. Um, I made a brave decision and um, tried to attack product design first. And um, in order to make this work against all expectations, I needed some strong help. So decided to cold call uh, actually the DFMA guys over there on the other side of the Atlantic and uh, asked for an introduction workshop. Obviously, um, the guys were pretty happy to do that. And we spent a lot of time uh, setting up the workshop with three things in mind. The first thing was to have as wide participation as possible, to use multifunctional teams um from different principles make them come together and recognize the same problem and then also be empowered to solve it use practical cases on our products so get the products in provide tools ask the people to disassemble them look at them get ideas and then use the dfma method to calculate the potential uh, the third and final point is actually build a team. That was what it was all about. People thinking the same way. So in uh, March of 2018, uh, Chris Tsai and Dave Sweet from uh, Boothroyd Newhurst uh, came over to Greece, visited our R&D center. And we spent a week analyzing uh, samples of our products and learning how to use the DFMA method and the software. We worked in different cross-functional teams and we split basically the product into the functional groups I described earlier. And you see now also in the pictures. On the right, you see the whole team. Um, after the workshop, all smiles, all very happy. But I can assure you that in the beginning, it was not at all like this. So I have included a couple of other pictures here. 
um, just to show you a little bit of the body language when Chris was trying to explain to people that simple stuff can be made simpler. Actually, it, it took about two days for the teams to produce results that surprised even themselves. They were able to reduce fasteners, bracketry, and other parts between 25 and 50%. And this was both in co complex and simpler products. And that was just to convince the teams of what was easily possible. Then they go to work. So in the second part of this presentation, I would just like to illustrate some results uh, coming from the simpler and most cost-effective product range of India, all driven by the product development R&D team there. And I will be focusing on the three things uh, highlighted on the left. So uh, I'm going to be giving four different examples, one uh, with the cooling mechanism itself, and you can see on the little graphic on the right, uh, the little green dot on the bottom. The slide-out arrangement for the cooling base, which is part of the cabin, on the bottom left, and a DFMA example, so both DFA and DFM, for the evaporator, fan cover, and assembly on the top. I will be closing with a little bit of a more holistic example, something we call the choco cooler, and you will see later on uh, what this is. So I would like uh, just to uh, start with the cooling mechanism and its base. So the base is a flat steel sheet, uh, is galvanized, and all the components are mounted there. And as you see, there are several. So all of the components have their own individual function. This is very difficult to combine, but the way we are mounting them actually was hiding a lot of opportunity. So the designer team in India was able to reduce fasteners and some parts by about 40%. And this was actually easily confirming what uh, we did in the introductory workshop. Things worked, it was easy. And what was the trick? Uh, if you look at the right-hand side after DFA, the cooling base, you have a hint. And Actually, the secret was basically to uh, use the capabilities of our metal sheet processing machines to form pockets in which our assemblers could just simply slot in the components and then secure them with half the fasteners that we have been using. Now, the labor time savings for this particular operation were 17%. If you want to put it in a wider perspective, the total cooling mechanism labor cost contribution, I showed this a couple of slides earlier, is about 23% on average. And about half of that is hidden on what you see here in the cooling mechanism base assembly. So we are talking about an almost 2% improvement in the total labor cost per unit only out of this simplification. It may not sound much, it is not a very big double digit figure, but in a business where the profit margins are also single digit, this is actually quite significant. The thing is that our team in India did not stop there. Um, a few slides back, I took some time to present the complexity behind the range offering uh, with many models and thousands of variants, which create material handling and uh, all sorts of assembly complexities. Now, using the lessons learned and applied right here, the team also took the next step and proceeded to standardize the layout of the cooling mechanism, the fast runner families of the range. What you see here is about 40% uh, of our volume. And 
actually we simplified and standardized and this helped us reduce not only the labor costs but also inventories and the procurement leverage actually the designers were able to find components to replace anything between two and five different other types of components and you can imagine the kind of leverage we can get uh, from our procurement um, not strictly a dfma result but a very very desirable side effect uh, the team over there is particularly proud of so i promised i would share this with you today as well our next example has to do with the cost of the base of the cabin if you recall one of the functional requirements for a commercial cooler is the ease of serviceability in the market so to provide that the whole cooling mechanism need to be needs to be slid out and to do that we have some rail arrangements on the bottom here the team simply incorporated the locating function for the sliding motion into the cooling base itself so they removed the rails and associated fasteners altogether for this particular operation the labor time savings were 30 percent in total this represents about one percent of the labor total labor cost of the plant in terms of improvement so after only two examples we are at about a three percent labor cost savings which at least for a european plant which is trying to catch up with the euro inflation at between one and a half and two percent is already even quite a sizable amount you can imagine in india uh, moving now to the top of the cooler and a little bit away from the from dfa at the moment let's have a look at the dfm example uh, the evaporator fan casing you see in the little graphic on the top right that this subassembly is basically going on the top inside of the cabin again its function is to hold the air circulation fans in front of the evaporator while also providing a sort of plenum to keep noise low and finally also deal with uh, the content sense that we get there um, here the team tried to perform a dfa but soon realized that the geometrical complexity of this subassembly uh warranted a different approach and actually going over to plastic so the analysis we did using the dfma software indicated that we could get about 25 percent in savings and this translates to an estimated yearly saving of more than 150 thousand uh, dollars uh, we designed the part immediately and ordered the mold this will yield a cost saving of about 1% in the total raw material cost of the plant. Um, now, if you would come back and say, look, why was this part being made out of metal sheet in the first place? I mean, it naturally looks like a very good candidate for a plastic solution. Well, here, here the answer is as simple as it is disturbing. You see, we have our nice CNC punching equipment and bending machines in the plant. We do not really have injection molding. So, uh, you know, this is what we can do internally from sheet metal, and this is how we have been designing. It works, the customer likes it, point closed. So basically, the answer here is both design and manufacturing habit, which is precisely what we are targeting to shatter using the dfma approach this is one of many examples but right now the design sourcing manufacturing and quality engineering teams think a little bit differently um, but this is not only for them actually this is also for our workers you see the evaporator fan casing is mounted during the final assembly of the cooler on a conveyor line the assemblers do this work standing up reaching far above their shoulder height and, and try to fasten it with self-tapping sheet metal screws while trying to hold it in place aligned with the pre-punched holes in the mounting brackets they are fighting gravity more than 150 times in their shift 
also trying to keep up with the cycle time and quality. Very, very hard. What was the old approach? The old solution was to basically throw resources into a design problem. Use two people to do the work that one guy could easily make. One assembler holding the part, another assembler bolting the part. So after doing the DFMA um, treatment on this part, our designers started thinking very, very simply. Why should we need all of those screws? Why don't we hang the evaporator from the back of the cabin and then use just one guy and two screws to fix it in place? So this is a very illustrative example of not only solving the design by habit problem, but also getting the designers much close to the action on the floor. The DFA analysis on the finalized um, evaporator casing made out of plastic also showed a labor time saving of 17%. Actually, the saving is closer to 50%. Uh, this is the software calculating time without taking into account our own internal inefficiency, the old way of solving the problem, put more people onto a design mistake. Final example for today is a little bit more holistic. It involves the whole cooler, but it is also very, very indicative as you will see below. The related product is actually the smallest and newest ground up design of our range in India. We call it the chocolate cooler. It's a small bench top cooler designed for easy customer access near the store checkout point. So uh, uh, the customer just goes to pay, sees a chocolate bar, opens the, the top lid, he can see the bars, grabs one, pays also for that out of the door. We made a sale uh, uh, purely in the last minute. So for this cooler, actually, there's no requirement for fast pull down of the products. We do not really need to cool the chocolates. We just need to maintain them at the temperature below their melting point. So uh, the cooler is actually much simpler than the classic upright coolers I was showing you before, because it is using a solid state Peltier effect cooling mechanism instead of the classic uh, compressor and evaporator approach. So in effect, we're talking about only two moving parts, a couple of fans. So we went ahead and designed the cooler without really putting an emphasis to DFME. And actually, our people having, getting, having been used to design much more complicated coolers than this thought, I mean, this is dead simple. How much simpler can it get, right? Wrong. And actually, this was a little bit of a kick in the stomach because when we prototyped and marketed the cooler, it became apparent that the margins were not what we were expecting. And this was because of both material and predominantly production costs. So we hit a wall there and we needed to reduce costs by 15 to 20% in order to make the business case work. And all of that out of a very, very simple product. So how to do that out of nothing that this product really is? Okay, the team revisited with a DFMA approach in a very rigorous manner. And lo and behold, they were able to identify assembly labor time opportunities of the order of 18%. Something out of nothing. This is how they did it. Actually, the good old recipe, drastic reduction of fasteners and other bracketry. Uh, you will recognize maybe on the top left, the usual fan grill. This was a part that had been happily removed from the plastic fan case, from the metal fan casing uh, case I showed you before. And now it had found its way back into this design. Uh, actually, <laughs> this metal part that holds this, let's say, grill is outsourced. And the supplier 
already had tools to form this guarding feature to the fan with very little extra cost, much less than the, than the fan grill part. Nobody had just thought of asking them. They just assumed that this was not possible. And you know what the people say about assumption. Um, similar cases, uh, as you see, were discovered for other areas where fastening was required. The, the general thing is changing part design to avoid screwing and moving over the requirement to the suppliers who could happily accommodate our requirements without extra cost. That was the name of the game. So the lesson here was for us, never assume something simple is simple enough. Use the method and maybe your supplier will be happy to accommodate simplicity without increase in his own complexity. I would like to close the presentation with a, a couple of key takeaways. Um, we introduced the FMA in the company and this gave quick and measurable results. We were able to quickly reduce our cost by mid single digit uh, percentage points in India for a highly cost conscious market with similar level margins. This has proven significant. Um, starting uh, with small steps, easy opportunities, remove fasteners, remove bracketry, rethink how you source your components. The last two bullet points are actually part of the sales pitch, so to say, of uh, the DFMA guys to us before we started our journey together. They said, look, ROI typically achieved within one or two projects. True. The amount of savings I have showed you amounts to several hundred thousands of dollars per year. And this is not what the introduction workshop and the software cost. Making DFMA a habit is a challenge, they say. Also quite true, as I showed you in the last example. So the effort needs to continue. A couple of our next steps. Um, I have talked a lot about our Indian, uh, let's say, R&D hub. Back in Europe, we have been incorporating the key learnings into a completely new range and architecture of products that are going to be launching in 2021. Now, we know how to make good coolers. We know how to achieve performance and improve our aesthetics. The key here is simplicity and standardization. What we did on a small scale in India, we're going to do on a big scale over in our uh, center of gravity, which is Europe. The target is actually to slash labor time by 40 to 50 percent. And this will have an effect of several million. The good thing is that the first prototypes seem to be on track. So DFMA worked for us. And let's say stay tuned for the next generation of savings in trigger glass. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Hector, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you from the audience. One is, um, has the dramatic reduction in fastener count shown any degradation in product lifespan or ease of repair? Thank you for the question. Not at all. Quite the contrary. Everyone is happy. Procurement is happy. The service technicians are happy. The assemblers are happy. Not at all. Okay. Um, and then uh, one other one. Um, the question is, did you see any COPQ savings as a result of uh, this work? And the, the sort of parentheses part of that is less scrap, improved warranty, less rework, etc. Uh, actually, we saw, I cannot relate directly the effect, but generally speaking, in terms of cost of rework, this has dramatically dropped because of the ease of taking components out and replacing them. In terms of product reliability, actually, this is more down to component level 
in what we're manufacturing, manufacturing rather than the assembly in itself. Perfect. Thank you very much. So again, there's uh, several other questions queued up, but I, I think in the interest of time, um, we're going to keep moving forward. I, I guess one one that's probably the audience is is wondering about that has popped up is, um, did you have uh, good management support when this uh, journey started? And if not, do you have that good management support for this now after after those first successes? Yes, thank you for that. Um, as I said, this whole thing was launched against expectations. So in the beginning, ma the rest of the management was a little bit skeptical. When the results started flowing in, um, you turn skepticists into believers. So it's a very different situation now. Yes, there is management support at the moment. It was not like that from the beginning. Okay, thank you very much. Well, again, Hector, uh, thank you for taking the time to present and share your uh, your successes. I think uh, the audience found it to be very, very informative. So thank you again. Um, so up next, we have uh, Matt Miles. Matt is an advanced manufacturing engineer with Markham Image. Matt leads the DFMA application uh, at Markham's new global development center in Watertown, Mass. That's Massachusetts, sorry, for those of you uh, not in the Northeast or the US. Uh, in his role, he works with the product division and supply chain teams to help develop new products for their lines of industrial coating equipment. Matt's background is in mechanical engineering with over 20 years of product development experience and 15 of those years directly practicing DFMA. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering technology and a master's of science in product development, both from the Rochester Institute of Technology. And perhaps his biggest accomplishment and proudest moment is that Matt is also a member of Boothroyd Dewhurst's prestigious club, the DFMA Supporter of the Year, which he was awarded in 2009. Thanks, Matt, and take it away. All right, th thank you, Nick. That joke never gets old. All right, well, uh, again, thank you for uh, Boothroyd Dewhurst for uh, setting this up. Typically, would they they hold a forum every year on DFMA, and obviously, we understand the, uh, we're in a bit of a, a anomaly of a year. Uh, but it's good that we're able to adjust to that and uh, have this virtual event. Um, and so, while I was preparing to uh, determine what to talk about, um, it kind of took me back to uh, when I did first start uh, with DFMA back in 2006, and uh, Learned about the software, learned what a power tool can be, uh, but at the same time, took me also back to the Great Recession, 2007 to nine. Uh, at that, companies had to respond. Uh, numerous cost reduction activities. Uh, where I was at the time, I was heavily involved in, in cost reduction work, and uh, you know, here we are again in, in a similar climate. Thinking about what we'll talk about, I thought a topic uh, should be chosen that, that would be beneficial for the moment. So that's what we're going to talk about today is, is a starting up a supply chain DFM should costing program. Uh, it's a, a, how the DFM module can assist in supplier negotiations on part costs, which will lead to cost savings. So we'll go through quick data for me an intro to Mosh products and then we'll uh, look at uh, different part types that fit nicely into the DFM and next talk about how to establish DFM at your company and then we'll walk through the process of uh, DFM should costing for concluding uh, with a so a little bit about Markham as a company. Uh, the quick history is a, a long history, actually. We've been around for over 100 years. Uh, more recently, uh, we were acquired by uh, Dover Corporation. And Dover paired that with their uh, French company, uh, and they have it. There's uh, Markham Homage. 
Uh, so clearly we had similar products uh, for industrial coating equipment. Um, various types of printers that I'll uh, so the top left you can see uh, laser printers and I think that's a uh, bottle there so if you ever seen that or, or a, a soda can or soda bottle just at the bottom or on the side and you can see the marking from a laser and interesting they do about uh, on, a, on a line they can mark uh, about 150,000 cans per hour which is amazing uh, then to the right, there's a pallet coating. You can see an example of a, a shipping label. Uh, we uh, bottom left is large character uh, high res piezo or uh, uh, hot melt uh, inkjet printers. And then on the on the lower right is uh, thermal inkjet. You can get a feel for what it look like in controller systems. Uh, basically a um, it with all the electronics uh, mounted inside uh, metal and the ever common touch screen used in pretty much everything today. Uh, so let's look at uh, some of the parts that we have uh, which are fairly common and also some of the materials. So as mentioned you you can see we have sheet metal uh, covers. Uh, we inside we typically have mill and, and, and lathe machine parts. We use a little bit of die cast, injection mold, uh, and obviously PC boards. We won't talk too much about those, uh, but you can run those with DF. In common materials, uh, carbon steel, stainless, as well as thermoplastics. So these are the types of parts. Uh, if you've never put them through the DFM module before. Uh, typically ideal for uh, sheet metal or, or your traditionally machined parts and, and to go through the process of uh, uh, costing these out. So from there, where do you start? Well, let's start with establishing the software. And what do I mean by that? That's really showing the buyers in supply chain what the software can do. Um, if you reach out to our friends at Boothroyd Dewhurst, you can Start with a trial DFMA license. Uh, if you have the software already, even better. Uh, but what you want to do is, uh, if your buyers or anyone in supply chain as a group has not seen the software, um, there's a picture of it uh, on the upper right there uh, of a part I ran. Um, and what you want to do is show them what they can get from the software. And basically, in the model tree, you're you're creating that virtual routing or manufacturing process. Uh, additionally, you can compare multiple uh, materials and processes, uh, and there are multiple report options to analyze the data, and that's the data used in supplier negotiations. So a sample shown on the left is the uh, cost breakdown, and it's a nice way to show all the uh, each operation and the time it takes uh, and, and the cost per operation. So it's a good summary. Uh, and my story from MI is when I, I showed this to one of our buyers who's, uh, he's been in supply chain for a long time, a very good technical background. And I showed him a, I think the first part I ever ran for him was a sheet metal part and a small bracket. And after 10 seconds of looking at that, he just said, this data is going to be invaluable for us. Uh, it's going to lead to a lot of savings. So I never really saw that reaction in that quick time from somebody. I'm, I'm sure it's probably common, but uh, uh, I knew we'd be off and running. So, uh, so why do we want to do this process? Why start up a DFM should costing? Well, to start there, it can generate cost savings without design changes. So it, that's going to appeal to the supply chain group. Uh, it may be tough at times to get engineering support, uh, but this way, uh, no changes are required. So that's kind of the starting point. And to begin this, um, let's go to parts selection. The easiest thing to do is Pareto out your parts. I'm just showing some uh, dummy examples here. Uh, but you want to just apply the 80-20 rule, target your highest spend parts, and start up with your DFM uh, analyses. Um, the last three, the bottom three bullets are just uh, tidbits of information that I've experienced. Um, 
when you start this up and ask your buyers for a parts list, they, they may even have parts uh, that they, they know they want to target, parts they might have uh, problem, uh, problems with cost that, that, they, that they know of. So they might come to you uh, with those parts. Um, I think you can see in the previous presentations, uh, most of our companies nowadays have multiple sites. So I encourage you to reach out to uh, any, of, any of your sites um, and, and build that list. Um, and as I mentioned, the supply chain is going to welcome that technical input to, uh, to really dissect these parts, uh, look at functionality, uh, design intent, um, not to mention tolerancing and anything else that you can be uh, that you can glean from the prints. So the process is actually rather short. There's like three or four steps, but uh, once you gather your list of parts, you want to gather the info uh, on each of those parts. So uh, for bookkeeping, and we're going to build a spreadsheet after this, as, as most people commonly do, you're getting your part number. Uh, if you can get the 3D model, uh, that's that's good as well. Uh, DFM, you can insert, uh, exp import models into DFM, ideal for your uh, injection mold parts or castings, things like that. Uh, I typically go and compare against standard cost and understand the annual volume as that'll factor into the life volume in DFM. Uh, and then typical uh, lot size that supply chain buys the part in probably the most uh, has the most impact on, on running your DFM. So once you get that information, transfer that over to your DF, that DFMA team, whoever they, that may be, and we're gonna talk uh, uh, in detail on that a little bit later. But here's where you're just using the tool. Start creating a DFM should cost analysis for each part. Uh, DFM's gonna break the cost down into five areas. Uh, the material cost per part, it's set up time for uh, all the machines that, are, that it's set up on and processing time, actual machine of the part or, or uh, again, cycle time for an injection mold part. Uh, cost for any rejects and tooling and tooling costs are amortized into the analyses. Um, and then you want to export those DFM reports. And I mentioned the cost breakdown. That's my personal favorite just because of uh, everything that it shows. Uh, uh, but there are a couple others that we'll, we'll also talk about. So step three, you're going to end up with a spreadsheet that looks something like this. Uh, you want to you summarize everything, everything and go back to your supply chain and uh, review this data. Um, some of the parts you're going to show a, uh, a cost validation, and that's okay. Uh, the bottom two parts you can see uh, came in at around uh, $2 separation. Uh, so you really probably don't want to go after those parts and kick the supplier in those, but you want to focus on the top two parts. Uh, you can see the uh, percentage difference uh, between uh, the standard cost, what you're paying today, and what DFM tells you you should be paying, as well as uh, you get an estimated cost savings uh, for those. So th those are big targets, and that, those are the ones that uh, you want to identify those cost gaps and uh, go after. And the fifth step is engaging with suppliers. Uh, a bit wordy on this this slide, but uh, bear with me. Uh, it's really getting that uh, all that analysis, uh, those summaries return to supply chain, and then begin the negotiations with your incumbent supplier. Um, you can requote with them. You can look to quote with others and resource. Uh, but this is where the discussion uh, on the DFM cost breakdown is essential. So go through the five areas. Um, and then there are a couple, there's numerous ways to, to extract data out of DFM uh, before the main reports are shown here. An executive summary, uh, the responses uh, uh, option gives you a way to compare your DFM inputs to what the supplier sets up uh, as they process apart. Uh, obviously, the cost breakdown and the totals breakdown just shows the five areas uh, in, a, in a summary. Another good one. Um, and then supplier profit, that can be included as a custom operation. Um, just put an input, a uh, percentage value input into the operation. Uh, for industrial type parts, I typically use about 15 to 20 percent. And that's my dog in the background. Sorry about that. 
Um, so that discuss so that is where you want to start the uh, discussion with suppliers. And when you do that, you should get something like this. So you're taking that uh, first spreadsheet that we set up, and now you're getting additional quotes. So uh, going after the top two parts where we identified a gap, you could again have multiple supplier quotes, and but the goal is to uh, look to use that data and talk about uh, how the part is made and get into the details, uh, the finer details with some data. So you're giving data to your supply chain team instead of just going into straight negotiations, uh, just talking about price and, and you know where it's at, things like that. So I, I should mention that, uh, uh, and I'm not sure if he's out there, but uh, I did a lot of work with uh, a uh, gentleman named John McIntyre over the years, and uh, John kind of taught me this approach, and he's always said uh, it's a non-adversarial approach when you uh, talk to, to the suppliers with this data. Uh, you're forming that partnership, and I think this is a way to uh, really get the discussions going uh, even further. Um, so again, I mentioned that uh, the goal is trying to get cost reduction without any real design changes, but uh, when you get into this level of detail, uh, the discussions are going to go into a few different areas. So let, let's talk about a few of those. So discussion results. Um, you are going to end up talking about uh, alternative materials uh, and uh, alternative manufacturing processes for, uh, for cost reduction. Um, and that gets into things like adjusting the tolerances of, as well. Um, the screenshot on the left, the chart shown there, that's right from DFM Help. Uh, I've ran a number of uh, workshops on DFMA, and I cannot get through a workshop without calling this up and discussing it. Uh, but here, DFM really takes the uh, surface roughness as an input and equates that to an approximate tolerance uh, that you would take off of the print. And that's how, how it adjusts for that. So the finer the surface roughness, uh, the increase in tolerance and increase in cost. Um, another uh, thing within DFM, I'm not sure, might be a little bit hidden, but is the, it's the, uh, there's a guide to cost reduction. So on the right chart, um, that's from a part I analyzed and uh, you can export that out and it'll show, uh, things like uh, machine limitations and additional operations and how they're in, impacting cost. Uh, so it's another um, good way to look at your parts and dive in. And it's, it's kind of the overall or the uh, general design for manufacturability uh, approach to uh, looking at your parts. So those are, are some of the areas where the discussions may go. And I should note that uh, this whole approach to understanding the cost of your individual piece parts that can still carry over to what you're doing up front in new product development. So if you're developing new products, new concepts, you can understand the cost of your parts uh, with the same process. And here's an example of those alternatives that you, you can find. Uh, this is an example uh, that I ran into a couple months ago. Uh, so we had a question on a part design and what manufacturing path should we take was the question and, I, and we started out with an injection mold part we had some uh, design issues come up and we started throwing out ideas of what to look at so um, i ended up running this this analysis um, on a variety of of processes to use with different materials so you can see the different processes selected and where we ended up with part cost um, and, and also how it impacted tooling, uh, what materials we selected and their costs. Um, if you've seen the uh, infamous, uh, I think it's the Apache helicopter uh, from uh, example from Alfredo Herrera uh, years ago, they had a five piece uh, weldment that they ran a DFM and looked at machining it from a solid block and they ended up going in that direction with, with full cost. Now, obviously we didn't get there, but we at least were able to look at that as an option. So, uh, and I show up there, uh, once you're proficient, proficient with the tool, um, you get one or two uh, analyses set up and then they can transfer over quickly copied and it, this 
All this information took me uh, about an hour. So DFM is going to give you the, the ability to you know, quickly do these comparisons uh, for database design decisions. Okay, in the last uh, couple slides, I'll just call these some some parting shots. Um, just to just to show that um, um, others out there have used this type of program. Uh, I'll mention a few others in the uh, DFMA community. Uh, David Meeker to start is, uh, uh, I guess, what's the old saying? He's probably forgotten more about DFMA than than I've learned. But uh, Dave has done, and I think we've talked about this. Uh, in the past, I think he's done about 23 uh, papers and presentations over the years at the forum. Uh, and his 13, uh, 2013 paper talked about the same topic on cost estimating, uh, what it is, how do you do it, and what can it do for you. And in that, he does talk about should costing and its, it's kind of origin. He may not agree with, uh, I think it's uh, the, the phrase should costing, I use it because it's the catchiest of the phrases to uh, Kind of hang on at a company, um, but he has some good details in there. And then more recently, uh, a gentleman named Fred Johnson presented a paper, um, a case study, same thing on supplier costing. Um, but uh, interesting, interesting is uh, the the area is low volume medical device products, and he showed um, just tremendous cost savings with this approach. Uh, just similar to what uh, uh, Hector just showed. Uh, both gentlemen are in the infamous club as well. And I uh, did, and I do still have my uh, award on the right there to uh, toot my own horn. But it's a goal that you can set out to do is uh, start up a program and uh, get yourself into this club. So um, on, on should costing, uh, I'll say it's the best place for the uh, quick wins, and I know Hector touched on that, and he also mentioned uh, using that ROI. Uh, so the captured savings you can get from this uh, so should costing program will validate, justify uh, procuring the software. And then on, uh, I talked about who typically drives should costing program. Um, I would say most common at companies is a VABE group, value analysis, value engineering. Um, these groups uh, typically are anointed the, quote, cost reduction groups. Um, then you have value chain engineers. They may get into a little bit of, um, if you're sourcing in different geographies, you could get into uh, studying piece part costs and landed costs and, and total cost of ownership as well. Uh, some companies do have specific cost engineers to do this, uh, traditional manufacturing engineers drive the software as well. Uh, my title, Advanced Manufacturing, uh, I, I say it's kind of a trendy way of uh, saying someone that can bridge the gap from uh, product development, design engineering, over to supply chain and operations. So those are typically who drives uh, the, the DFM should cost the program. However, it doesn't mean that our design engineers Anyone in product development or anyone within supply chain um, can't pick this up. They can become the, the DFM should costing driver. And then my final thought, uh, a little bit of uh, philosophical in nature, I guess. Um, starting up with the should costing program is going to give you a good starting point. And it is a nice segue into DFA and a full DFMA implementation program. Um, as you go through the process, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna help determine your knowledge gaps. Um, as you, and remember, as your parts are analyzed, you're gonna continue to build a library of data that's gonna help you uh, determine the following. Um, what materials and processes does your company currently rely on and why? What are the design constraints that lead to using those? Um, what new materials and processes would support your designs and still be cost effective. So that's a little bit of uh, value engineering thought. Uh, I think Mr. Devinish is gonna touch on that next. But when you get to that point, um, you wanna look at those uh, opportunities, uh, identify those and look to prove them out. And I've said this uh, in the past, probably a few times, uh, but if you are a design engineer and you're getting introduced to DFMA uh, and anyone really, um, 
the, one of the biggest things you can do is go visit your suppliers. Uh, if you have a supplier quality group, go uh, see if you can visit suppliers, see how parts are made, uh, again, traditional machining or sheet metal parts, injection mold, you name it. Um, all that's going to contribute to how you go about your design and go after uh, costs of your parts. Okay, so quick summary is uh, how do you start up your DFM shoot costing program? Very simple. You gather your list of parts, you get your DFMA team set, start running the analyses, uh, gather your data, review that with your supply chain team, and then you prepare that data and use a negotiation with your suppliers to convert into cost savings. And most importantly, don't wait. Uh, don't wait for another a huge recession. Don't wait for what we're in right now. Um, this can be done. Uh, and you've seen the examples of uh, some of my uh, parts and, and I mentioned a few others. Uh, there's numerous papers uh, and, and companies and individuals that have driven programs like this. So if you haven't started, uh, I I'd encourage you to do so. So that's all I had for today. And I think with that, I'll, I'll take a few questions if there's time. Yeah, Matt, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Excellent information as always. Um, there are a couple of questions here from the audience. One is, um, how did you convince the supplier that your should cost was trustworthy? And did you check against the supplier's own, did you sort of you know, verify or discuss or, or check against the supplier's own data? Mm, yeah, excellent. Uh, in a few instances, uh, and I have met with suppliers, and we've actually shown uh, the DFM, uh, say on an overhead or, or right off off the laptop, to where we're reviewing an analysis of their part, and we've actually altered inputs changes. Uh, so we we've shared that data uh, and and tried to be upfront. Uh, with them, and and that leads to a better discussion as well. So when you're you're taking some of their suggestions and, and making changes, uh, but that's that's how we've done it in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, one one final question, and then we'll we'll move on. Uh, when you've done this type of analysis, do you typically first go to the existing supplier to try and negotiate with them if there's a big cost difference between your your should cost and their quoted price, or do you simply look for a, a new supplier right away? Yeah, typically it is directly to the original supplier. And again, it's talking about that that uh, comparison gap of the standard cost and, and DFM cost. Um, and I think it's, uh, you will run into some uh, resistance, if you will, but I think that's where the discussion takes place that you can, start with the incumbent supplier have that discussion if things don't go well you yes you have an option to uh to resource elsewhere but the start is with the incumbent yes okay great and uh, you know not to sort of you know steal your thunder sort of thing but but to just kind of pile on to what you're saying my own two cents here and i think this is often lost with a lot of people is that the difference or the gap uh, between a DFM should cost and the quoted price of this from the supplier is actually what you want. Uh, if our tools always told you the same thing that your supplier's quotes told you, then what's the point in even undertaking the exercise, right? You don't really want a tool that tells you what you already know. You want to see those gaps. And obviously, there's going to be gaps sometimes and not gaps others uh, as a result of the different quotes from the suppliers and the different parts and the different processes. But reconciling the difference between a quoted price and the should cost to manufacture really is the power of the, the DFMA tool. So, you know, for those of you out there that that do your first analysis and the supplier's charging you a dollar for a part and the software says it should cost 50 cents, don't immediately jump to the conclusion that you did something wrong. That's the power of the software. Now understand what is the reason for that difference. Um, and therein lies the the work and the power and the opportunity for savings. Yep, you're right, Nick. And that's the discussion is is where all the good stuff comes out of. So, yeah, that's that's right. Okay, Matt. Well, thank you very much again. 
um, we're, we're going to move on to our, our final presenter now, uh, Mr. Bill Devinish. So I'm going to make Bill the presenter here. And okay, Bill will you. be able to uh, share his uh, desktop with us here in a minute. Um, and while he's doing that, I'm going to tell you that uh, Bill is a longtime DFMA advocate. As the global DFMA expert, he's implemented DFA at numerous large and small companies with products ranging from high volume electronics to low volume customizable assemblies. While R&D manager at Nokia, Bill led a team that developed the first smartphone released in North America. He holds 10 patents and has authored several papers related to DFMA. Bill's facilitation skills and passion for DFMA result in successful workshops, training, and cost reduction efforts. And I would finally add uh, that Bill is also a member of that exclusive club, being awarded the 2016 DFMA Supporter of the Year Award. Bill, go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, and, and thank you, Booth Roy Dewhurst, for inviting me to discuss design for value where we're combining the DFMA should cost results with some of the elements within value engineering. I'd like to start by talking about uh, somebody that, that many of us are probably familiar with, a person by the name of Igor Sikorsky. And most people know that he was a developer of helicopters. But long before this, uh, he was actually very instrumental in the early aspects of aviation. He was originally born in Russia and then gained his engineering degree in France. And in 1913, he built the world's first four-engine aircraft. It was known as the Sikorsky Russian Knight. And this aircraft had some very interesting features. It had an enclosed cabin, it had upholstered chairs, it also had a lavatory inside of it. But one of the features I found most interesting was along the, the exterior of the fuselage, it had a catwalk where the passengers could get out and get some fresh air during their flight. Now, later in his life, Igor Sikorsky would often say this, in the early days, the chief engineer was very often also the chief test pilot. And then he'd go on to say, this tended to result in the elimination of poor engineering. And I mentioned that because as, as engineers and designers and development teams, one of the things we wanna do is, is put ourselves in the place of the customer and understand what does the customer want? What are their needs? Uh, similar to what Igor Sikorsky was uh, illustrating here. And so part of this activity uh, includes this design for value. And our objective here is to reach a customer price target by tracking both the material costs as well as labor costs. And you'll see why uh, we separate those as we go along in the presentation. We also want to be able to predict product costs with higher fidelity. We want to be able to provide, uh, define what the value is of the product that we're providing to the customer. And we want to identify opportunities to achieve that price target that has been set. Now, the, the steps that we go through and the process that we go through for this design for value is first, we, we identify the cost summary. Uh, what are the, the costs for the components that make up this product? Uh, we put the, this cost that includes both material and labor into a cost roll-up. Uh, we can also look at a Campbell curve to see where our costs uh, lie. And then we use a value graph to be able to identify areas where we can improve and, and reach our cost target. And that leads us to that brainstorming activity or ideation to be able to reach those cost targets. So that's kind of, those are the steps that we go through of the process that we follow. So I'd like to start with a, an example product here. This was a, a baseline design concept that a team came up with. And essentially they were tasked with enclosing a, 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 um, a circuit card assembly. And so it, it consists of a plastic housing that has inserts in it for the, the screws, as well as a plastic cover, and then the CCA itself. And the target price for this product was $12 to the customer. And so the, the team was able to roll up the, the costs of the different components, 
uh, identified what the components were, how much they cost. And part of the activity to develop these costs was uh, just as Matt had uh, reviewed earlier, identifying the should cost for uh, so, some of the components that are manufactured using that DFM tool. And so for the housing, it was $1.14. For the cover, it was $0.27. Cents. Uh, keeping in mind that the, the housing was uh, also included the uh, threaded inserts for the screws. Uh, both of them are in plastic injection molded parts. We also used the DFA tool to identify the, the time it would take to assemble this product. And so we see here that uh, the material cost is just over seven and a half dollars and the time to assemble is about a minute and a half. So we can take the, the total material cost and the, the labor cost, and we'll, we'll put that into a cost roll-up sheet. But the, before doing that, the team might look at this and say, well, we're well under that $12 cost target that we have for our customer. And many times the team would say, we're good, let's, let's go with this design. Uh, but that's why we like to use some of these other tools to see where we're really falling within the, the, our cost targets. And one of these tools is the cost roll-up, where here in the lower left, we put in the material cost and we put in that, that time estimate. And it gives us a, a prime cost of $9.14. Then we start to add in some of the overhead. We have a, an overhead rate for the material and a different overhead rate for the labor. And so now we have a total burden cost of $11.07. Then we add some uh, other overheads, the general and administrative costs, uh, where we get a total cost of $12.79. Then there's some additional overhead costs for project management and marketing, sales, advertising. Uh, which gives us a total cost, but yet we still haven't put in there any kind of a profit margin. And so we add a profit margin to this and we actually end up at a total price of $16.54, where our target price is $12. And so we, we haven't met the target. Even though our material costs uh, were pretty low and it looked like our labor uh, cost really wasn't adding much to it. And so now we move over into the Campbell curve to give us some more information about this. Uh, in the Campbell curve, we track the, the material cost along the x-axis and the labor rate or the, or the labor time on the y-axis. And in this case, uh, our, our target for a healthy goal for this type of product in this kind of uh, market was a 95-5 split. So 95% of the, the cost should be in the material, 5% in the labor. And that puts us at that green dot that's on the line uh, in this curve. Uh, the, the purple dot is where the current baseline concept is. Now we also add a plus or minus 10% tolerance range here. Uh, for the, the cost of, of the material and the labor. And really our target is to fall somewhere within that range. And we see that uh, our current baseline design concept falls well outside that, that range. And when you look at, at the, the graph itself, you can see that the labor is, is the biggest contributor to why we're not meeting our target. And so we need to bring the labor cost down or the labor effort down where the material cost is only slightly more than our target. So there's one more activity we look at uh, to be able to identify where can we start to focus our efforts to reduce that cost. And that's where we pull in some more of this value engineering activity. Uh, what we did was identify what are the key functions that this product must uh, fulfill and we identified that it needs to enclose electronics, it needs to process data, it needs to secure parts, and identify. there needs to be some way to identify product. So those are the key functions. We took that cost information that we had from our baseline design concept. Um, oh, I do want to mention that uh, 
when we're describing the functions for this product, we're using a, a two-word combination of a verb and a noun to describe those functions. And then we, we take that cost information. Now, in this case, it's the material cost and the labor cost combined. And we separate that out into the different functions. And we, we spread that out. And we see here, in this case, the process data is almost 60% of the cost. We also go through uh, a forced ranking of the importance of these functions compared to each other. So we'll compare each of these functions against the other and identify the percentage of importance for that function. Now, when we do this activity, we always remember that every uh, everything, every function for this product is important. It's the sum are more important than others as we're forcing that ranking as we go through this. Now that we've got this percentage of cost and percentage of importance, we can calculate what's known as the value index, where we essentially take the percentage of the cost, divide it by the percentage of importance for this value index, where if we have a one or greater, then that means that that function is providing uh, value to that product for the cost that it, it takes. If it's below a one, that's where we want to start to concentrate our efforts. And we can take this information then and put it on a value graph where the percentage of the cost is tracked along the, <clears throat> excuse me, the x-axis and the percentage of importance along the y-axis. The diagonal line on the graph indicates that, that value index of a one. Anything above the line has a value index of one or greater. Anything below the line is less than one. And this is where we can identify and see, ah, secure parts. That's where our effort needs to be focused in reducing cost here. And so with this information, the team then started to brainstorm and said, okay, here's what we can do. What if we remove the screws from the cover and put snap fits in their place? And so what we did was re-ran the DFM analysis uh, and were able to identify the new costs now for this. With the DFM should cost estimates, the, the housing cost actually went down as a result of this because it eliminated some of the threaded inserts that were in the housing. The cost for the cover went up slightly because now we're including some additional material and we have additional process time to accommodate the snaps. Now, one thing I do want to mention at this point is that uh, we, we really didn't have a, a flushed out CAD model yet. Uh, all we had was an early concept. And so even with just this concept idea, they were able to run these DFM should cost estimates as well as DFA analysis, uh, where we then looked at uh, what the reduction in labor time would be as a result of this. And we see that with uh, fewer screws, then we have a significantly less um, labor effort associated with it. So now we can take this information, the new material cost, the new labor estimate, put it into this cost roll-up, and we, we run it through, and we see that we're still beyond our target price. We're at $14.46. We look at our Campbell curve, and we see that we're still outside that, that target range that we have. We're getting closer to our goal, but we still have some work to do, and it looks like it's mostly in that labor area. So with this information, the team went back again and said, okay, what we can do is uh, similar to adding snaps to the cover and removing those screws, we can add some features to both the housing and the cover to hold it in place and eliminate the screws that hold the CCA within the enclosure. And so when we rerun the numbers there, we see that our, our housing cost significantly goes down, again, because of no threaded inserts there. Our cover cost stays about the same as the uh, uh, early redesign effort, but we also don't have the cost of the screws, the material cost, as well as the labor cost in there. Uh, and so that DFA estimate is updated. 
So now we can take this information, put it into our cost rollup, and now we're at twelve dollars and three cents. So we look at our Campbell curve, and we'll, uh, the blue dot there shows uh, redesign two uh, that has the elimination of the screws as well as inclusion of those uh, snap fit features, and we're well within that range. We can then go back and look at that value graph. Uh, the value graph is a relative activity, and so we see that the secure parts went from being a very uh, a costly item with low value to now no cost. Um, still has that same value of secure parts, uh, but now we look at this and we say, oh, well, now process data falls under that line. However, and, and most teams at this time, point a lot of times we'll say okay let's start focusing on that let's let's see what we can do to reduce the cost of the processing data uh, however um, that's not necessary because we actually met the, the target price and so now it's time for the team to go and start actually completing the details of their design and so in in summary um, the DFMA tools provide that early should cost data for both the material and the labor, which we then use for these uh, different tools, where with the cost roll-up chart, we're using that material and labor estimate to display the eventual price to the customer, so we can see how close we're coming to that target. The Campbell curve helps identify the impact of material and labor costs toward meeting that target. And then our value graph shows us where to focus those cost reduction efforts, where the team should be uh, putting their energy to try to identify those areas of cost reduction. So the combination of DFMA should cost, cost roll up, Campbell curve, and the value engineering tools support ideation to meet product price targets. So I'd like to thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, I can take a moment to answer them. Bill, uh, thank you very much. Excellent presentation showing uh, some unique uses of uh, DFMA data uh, and, and putting that into some value engineering effort. One, one question that, uh, that was sent in is, could you explain to us how you calculate the slope of the Campbell curve? Ah, okay, let me go back to that. Um, so the Campbell curve, uh, again, we're tracking the, the material cost along the x-axis, the labor in time along the y-axis. And really, the, the slope is defined based on how you set up uh, the numbers within the axis. So if, if I were to say right now it's 0 to $15, if I were to go 0 to $20, uh, that would shift the angle or the slope of of those curves. Uh, so really the, the, the curves aren't tied, that the slope of the curves really aren't what we're focused on. It's where the dots lie in relationship to the curves uh, that uh, we're mainly focused on. All right, thank you for that explanation. Um, so that, uh, concludes our DFMA virtual event. Um, uh, on behalf of myself and everybody here at Boothroyd Dewhurst, I'd like to thank everybody for attending this. Uh, some tremendous presentations and uh, uh, highest attendance at a virtual event that, uh, that we've certainly ever had. So thank you all for, for being part of that. And uh, thank you for uh, presenters for making sharing your stories and uh, making this information available. We will be uh, providing uh, uh, it'll come from GoToWebinar, a, a link to the recording of this session afterwards. And um, again, if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at dfma.com or connect with us through our website, www.dfma.com. Thank you all very much and everybody enjoy the rest of your, your days. <laughs>